Thank you, Brother Blankship, for uh, the honor, trusting me behind this pulpit. It is a great honor, and I want to thank my wife. She's so helpful, and she pretty much says everything. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating that much. But uh, I want to take us to Scripture. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Look at Hebrews 12, 2. It says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. If I was going to title this message, I would just simply title it, The Love of Jesus. The love of Jesus. Can we pray one more time and just ask God to really just help me minister here tonight. Lord God, I pray, Lord Jesus, help me, Lord God. Anoint me tonight, Lord. Lord God, honor my preparation, Lord God. Lord, we know you're in this place, Lord Jesus. You're already ministering to us, Lord. Uh, speak to our hearts and minds, God. Help us receive the word, God, you have for us, Lord Jesus. Speak to us in an intimate way, Lord, I pray. Every last one of us here, God, help, Lord, all the ears be unstopped, Lord, uh, all the blocks, Lord, uh, Lord Jesus, all the, all the things that would hinder your work in here, Lord, we rebuke it in Jesus' name, Lord, and I thank you for everything, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. A debate has raged on for thousands of years. The argument for the existence of God. Now, if you've ever done any kind of Bible study, or you're going to eventually run into this, and you're going to look into this and then see, you know, what what's going on in that debate. What are the two sides? What are they saying? But this debate is uh, ages old because we can actually find it going on in King David's time. For he says in Psalms. 14 and 1, a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. There are many who today believe that God doesn't exist. Mankind hasn't changed throughout the ages. There's nothing new under the sun, no new idea. I like to tell those atheists, as we would call them, that historically and even currently, that atheist is greatly outnumbered by God-believing people worldwide. Now, whether they be this God or that God or the one true God, that doesn't matter at that point. But the atheist is greatly outnumbered. Now, although I don't think that a majority opinion justifies any belief system, I do, however, would give it more credence. Atheists will say in order to believe, they must have proof of God's existence. They want proof. Well, then I would ask an atheist one question. I would ask him, do you love your parents? And most of them, I'm sure, would tell me, yes, of course, I love my parents. And I would reply then, go ahead and prove it. Prove that you love your parents. They would probably look at me very confused not really having a good answer. But one of the many reasons that I know God is real is that He sent His only begotten Son to die for me. He proved His very existence by the love He's shown for me. That's how I know God is real. And John 15 and 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. On December 4th, 2006, Army Specialist Ross McGinnis Humvee wound through the worn torn section of Baghdad. Really, you can go ahead and put his picture. Specialist Ross McGinnis scanned the rooftops and alleyways from the turret 
the threats were many, and as the gunner, he was the eyes and ears for the four, four soldiers sitting below in the Humvee. As the six-truck patrol rolled through the neighborhood to deliver a generator to residents, McGinnis rode in the last Humvee. From the rooftop, an insurgent pitched a grenade wildly towards the truck, and by luck, I guess, it made, made, made its mark. McGinnis saw it and tried to bat it away, but it hit the roof and kind of rolled and fell inside the Humvee. It landed inside in between the other soldiers with a clang against the radio mount and between the driver, Sergeant Lyle Bueller and Thomas, the passenger. Grenade, McGinnis yelled. Where, they asked. It's in the truck. But before Thomas, the passenger, put his head between his legs and braced for the explosion that he thought was inevitable that would take his life, he saw McGinnis sit down, trapping the grenade between his body and the radio mount. He could have jumped out, Thomas said afterward. That's what we're trained to do. Alert the crew and jump out. The doors blew open and the truck filled with black smoke. The grenade killed McGinnis instantly and wounded the four others, but they survived. If Ross would have jumped out, Thomas said, there would have been four of us not here today. Lieutenant Colonel Ann Edgecombe, an Army spokesman, said McGinnis easily could have jumped out of the truck and saved himself. The instinct is to jump out of the vehicle, but his four buddies were in the vehicle with him, and he chose to place himself on top of the grenade, absorb the impact, and save their lives. You go to the next picture. On June 2nd, 2008, 19-year-old Army Specialist Ross McGinnis of Knox, Pennsylvania was given the Medal of Honor, our nation's highest military honor for his heroic and selfless act actions. He sacrificed his own life for the four others. Go to the next picture. Sometimes called frogmen, the Navy SEALs are the most elite fighting unit in our armed services today, if not in the world. They're the most highly trained, and their boot camp is among the most grueling mentally and physically in terms of training. In the Navy SEALs, it is often said that the only easy day was yesterday. As it was on April 2006, when the SEAL member Petty Officer Michael Mansour arrived in Ramadi, the most dangerous city in Iraq for U.S. forces. He and his teammates on SEAL Team 3 were attacked on 75% on their patrols through the city as they trained Iraqi soldiers. Mansour, a machine, gun, uh, a machine gunner, had fired thousands of rounds during three dozen gun battles with, with insurgents. On September 29, 2006, Mansour, three other SEALs, and eight Iraqi soldiers climbed on a rooftop from which they could watch over soldiers pushing through a dangerous neighborhood. The SEAL snipers fired on several men that had AK-47s, killing one and wounding another. Suddenly, over the loudspeakers, a nearby mosque uh, called out to the insurgents to attack the rooftop. They fired at the rooftop with automatic weapons and rocket-pelled grenades. One grenade tossed onto the rooftop actually smacked Mansoor right in the chest and dropped to the ground. Mansoor called out to the other two seals nearby, but there was no time to move and they didn't hear him. Standing near the exit, Mansoor could have dived to safety and saved himself. Instead, he collapsed on the grenade. The two other teammates near him were injured, but he absorbed most of the blast. He never took his eye off the grenade. His only movement was down toward it. A SEAL who was on the rooftop that day later said in an interview with the AP, he undoubtedly saved mine and other SEALs' lives, and we owe him. He said, Navy SEAL Petty Officer Mansour, next slide, was awarded the Medal of Honor for self-sacrificing actions that day. 
He never took his eye off the grenade. His only movement was toward it. Again, the seal said of his actions. He undoubtedly saved mine and other seals' lives. And we would not be here today without the sacrifice that Petty Officer Mansour made. And next slide. On April 8, 2008, President George W. Bush, with tears streaming down his face, presented the Medal of Honor to Mansour's parents. And during the funeral procession, as it was carried, the SEAL members, one at a time, almost every SEAL stationed on the West Coast grabbed their tridents off and smacked it on the coffin. And once a wooden coffin that started at the beginning, at the end of the procession was almost covered in golden tridents. All the SEALs honoring Mansour's sacrifice. Now perhaps these brave men learned self-sacrifice from the one who did it for all of mankind, Jesus. See, Jesus was actually the epitome of showing a self-sacrificing love so that countless others could live. But he did it not for those that he lived with or even knew as a human. He did it for those that he hadn't seen yet, who didn't even deserve it, who weren't even living right who were just living the all, any way they wanted. Jesus loved each of us so much that he was willing to march to the cross and endure a painful death. I think it is important that we also recognize John 15 and 11. It says, These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might not remain in you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. See, Paul had a great understanding of Jesus' heart without ever having met him in the flesh. If you connect this with Hebrews 12, 2, which we read earlier, which says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You see, John 15 was actually was written before Jesus went to the cross. So even as he spoke those words, let my joy remain in you, that your joy might be full. Even as he spoke of that, he knew what was going to happen. He knew what the plan was and where he was going to go. So I, I was wondering, how could he possibly see that as joy? I mean, he knows that he's going to endure this terrible death. He knows the pain he's going to go through and the suffering and the hours of agony. But yet it says that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You see, if you understand the plan of God in the very beginning, John 1.1, 1, 1, see, the Word was with God and the Word was God. In the very beginning, God had a plan. And you see... God's plan was finally coming into fruition in John 15. He could almost see it happening. All those thousands of years, uh, all this preparation, uh, all the things that had to fall in place exactly at the right exact moment, all was coming to fruition. And finally, Jesus said, you know what, those people 2,000 years from now, they're going to have access to grace. 2,000 years from here, those people sitting in Knack are actually going to have a chance to come and repent for their sins and have everlasting life. Uh, you know, those people, they're living half across the world. Uh, they're not going to have to uh, conform to some crazy religion. Uh, all they got to do is call on Jesus. Uh, he's the answer because Jesus made a way uh, 2,000 years ago. In Romans chapter 9 Verse 1 through 3 says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. So he's obviously saying, you know, I am serious right now. He is saying, my witness, my, I lie not, my conscience bearing me witness through the Holy Ghost. Says, I'm not playing around. He said, what I'm about to say, I am all, I am serious as all get out. He says, I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. 
It would seem that if David was a man after God's own heart in the Old Testament, then Paul would be David's counterpart in the New Testament. See, only a true Christ-like person would offer up their own salvation in exchange to save another. Paul had a burden for the Jews so great that he wanted to die in their stead. Some commentaries I was reading on this passage would left theologians baffled. They couldn't understand, you know, why someone in the right mind would actually give up their salvation so others could be saved. They couldn't understand, but they're trying to interpret it and then look at different versions and different transcripts. And, you know, there's got to be some mistake here. Paul really is not saying that. But as I read on, they came to the same, all came to the same conclusion. There's no other way to interpret this passage. Paul actually wanted to die in place of this, uh, for these Jews so they could be saved. He has such a burden for them. He has such a love of God in his heart uh, that I have to confess that I'm nowhere near. I can't imagine myself telling God that I'd rather sacrifice my own salvation so others could be saved. God help me, I'm just not there yet. So this message is really ministering to me in a way, and I hope it's ministering to you, that we get to that point where we're going to lay our life down for our brother. Not just physically, but we're going to go out of our way. We see someone in need that we're not just going to ignore him. We're not just going to walk past him in the altar, but... When God's tapping on the shoulder, look, you need to go pray for that person uh, that we'd actually go up and pray for them. If God gives you a word, that you'd actually go tell that person that word because they may be depending on you for that word. And mercy renews every day. We find in Psalms 23 and 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And also in Lamentations 3, 22 through 23, it says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You see, it doesn't matter what time you wake up, what day it is. Every time you step out of your bed, God's mercies are renewed. Monday morning, you may not feel too well. You wish you were probably back in the Sunday morning service with hooping and hollering, and maybe you feel like you got all this burden on you, but guess what? God's mercy is new right now. Every day, God's mercies are renewed. Hallelujah. Can we get a hand clap of praise right now? I felt a little bit convicted when I was putting this message together and something I haven't talked about much and I should have actually more. And I really had it in a message I preached years ago, the same verse, and God brought it to to my attention that that I need to preach this. You bring the first picture up, Brother Eli. It was a foggy night, November 19th, 2009. I was pretty much acting like an idiot. There I am on a motorcycle. I'm real cool. I thought, you know, you know, I've been I, I've been riding a motorcycle for three months. Hey, I'm pro now. <laughs> I rule the road. Yeah, there I am. I'm going fast, aren't I? But God, thank God for mercy. Because you know this is not going to end well. I mean, you just look at it. You know, this is, this is going to be bad. <laughs> just hold on. It's coming. But I want you to understand that God did a miracle in my life. It's nothing short of the mercy of God that I'm still alive here today. Amen. Well, I was. it was a foggy night. It was dark. It was a little bit damp. I even... God forgive me, I had someone on the back with me, but he's forgiven me and he fared a lot better than I am, so he's not dead, don't worry about it. Nothing like that. But I was driving ridiculously fast. I remember um, I, was, I was riding and I could barely see because I didn't even have my helmet on, which is even more of a miracle. Last time I looked down at my speedometer, I was going about 100, 110. I think I was actually 120. 
due to my inexperience and the s surrounding circumstances, the weather and all that, I came around to turn too fast. I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, couldn't navigate well. I didn't, couldn't have good control of the bike. Coming around too fast, I could barely see on top of that because I didn't have my helmet on. It was at night. And unfortunately, I came around too wide. I hit the gravel going about 100-something. Hit the, hit the ground. Somehow didn't bust my skull wide open. Rolled. I don't know how many times my bike flipped over. And I came to a stop. And I was laying on my back. And I was laying there, I was like, oh my God, what just happened? Stupidity, that's what happened. I remember being in the hospital and one of the instructors at TBC came, came to the, and I was still, I, I believe I was still in the ER. I, I was in nearly recovering and he came and he had two pennies in his hand. And he, and he went like this, handed out to me. I was like, what are those for? He's like, here's some cents. Thank you. I didn't receive it too well at the time, but I appreciate it a lot more. And I was in a real bad condition when I when the when I finally stopped and 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 all and my bike stopped flipping and rolling. I was laying there and I lifted up my my right arm and it just sagged down from the elbow. It just came straight down. I quickly realized that I was in a lot more worse shape than I thought. I grabbed my elbow, and I held it close, and I was laying in the middle of the road. All of a sudden, a car comes around the corner, and it's foggy as night. It does not see me. I literally had to roll across on my arm twice to get in the shoulder to get out of the road. Talk about a double miracle. You can go to the next picture. That's my motorcycle. Completely totaled. I just gave the title to the the towing company that towed. I just here, just have it. Just, I don't want it. Cause there I am in the back in the wheelchair. Go to the next picture. I really, my hands were swollen. Looks like I'm wearing gloves. Uh, I'm really not feeling that well. I mean, I don't even know why I was giving thumbs up. One of my thumbs was broken. You laugh now, but if you were laying there, I guarantee you, you'd feel my pain. Uh, I, this is before any surgery. You can go to the next picture. A uh, lot of road rash. I could show you a lot worse pictures, but I, I don't want to gross anyone out. I had road rash a lot on my arms, my legs, uh, every, everywhere. I had road rash. It's terrible. It's very painful. It's like having a burn. It's like a burn, but it just tears your skin off. You go to the next picture. There I am, almost ready to get out. Uh, there's my brace, my arms in. I'm just, I, I'm just, I can't walk. I can't do anything. Is is that the last picture? There I am. That's the last picture, I believe. There's my busy my bike, my wheelchair. Sad moment. <laughs> I'm trying to make this serious, but you guys are just laughing at me. I was in a lot of pain for a long time. But I want to show you this is this is nothing short of a miracle. Going 100 miles per hour around a turn with no helmet on. Totally inexperienced. Wrecked my bike out. Yeah, sure, I was injured. I spent over a month in the hospital. I, I was in there for Thanksgiving. almost missed Christmas. It was a very, very depressing time. Very terrible. If you ever spent any amount of time in the hospital, it's not fun. You're lonely. I was hurting. I couldn't take care of myself. But God, I, I'd rather go through that than be dead in my grave. God spared my life on that night. It's nothing short of the mercies of God. When I woke up that morning, God said, guess what? I got new mercies. Guess what? You're, you're, you're pretty ignorant right now, but God, I got mercies for you because you're under my covering. You know what? You may not make the best decisions today, but I got mercy for you. Don't worry. Uh, just keep living for God. Uh, you may make mistakes here and there. Uh, stupidity may enter in, but God has mercies for his people. 
That's why it's a dangerous thing for when someone is under the covering of the Holy Ghost and the grace of God to step out and go into the world and backslide. You're in a very, very dangerous spot. You can take that picture down. God has saved my life not only once, twice. Uh, I just felt the Holy Ghost not my notes, but I remember when I was in the Navy, I wasn't living right at the time. And I was on the aircraft carrier, and we were on doing CQs with the pilots, and I was standing there. It was night ops. And I don't know why God spared my life that night. I guess he... You know, he's like, well, I can use him later on down the road. I don't need him dead yet. But I was standing there, and, and, and if you know anything about the flight deck, it was one of the most dangerous working environments there is on Earth. I'm standing there at night and waiting for the aircraft to return, and not a whole lot was going on. We are just waiting. And one, one rule about the aircraft, uh, on the aircraft carrier, on the, on the, if you're working on the flight deck, never stand up there if you have nothing to do. There's no, if you don't have to be up there, you need to be down below deck. But regardless of that, I was up there, <coughs> and uh, something just didn't feel right. Some say it's sixth sense, but I believe it was the Holy Ghost. Something just didn't feel right. Things were going awry. People looked confused. A pilot dropped his tail hook into the net, and they were trying to get that out. Just things were, just didn't feel right. You've had that. You, I'm sure you've all had that feeling, the gut feeling. Something's not right here. So I was like, you know what? I need to just go down below deck. I, so I walked down below deck, went to our line shack, took off my cranial, looked at the TV screen. All of a sudden, I see a jet come by, sparks flying everywhere. It caught the wire, but it didn't stop because it, 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 it snapped the wire. Now, when an aircraft carrier comes down at that high speed and it snaps the cable, the resting cable, the resting cable is about this thick, probably actually thicker than I can put my hand around. But Thompson knows exactly what I'm talking about. You know, when an aircraft carrier comes in and breaks it, they actually call that snapback. And it, and it breaks it with such a force and a cable that big, when it whips back at such a high rate of speed that nothing stands its way. It'll literally break metal in half, whip right through aircraft. Uh, fortunately, it was the grace of God that I wasn't up there during that time because I missed it by one minute. God, and I was like, God is trying to reach me. Guy up there actually had his leg whipped off, just, just clean right off. Nothing can stop it. And I missed that by probably less than one minute. I'm telling you, you have a covering in the church. The mercies of God are renewed every day for those who are under the covering of God. Do not mistake it and don't take it for granted, church. Now, a biblical example of someone who wasn't the smartest. Peter was someone who, by all accounts, could have ended up like Judas. Matthew 26, verse 31 through 35, says, Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you in Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men go shall be offended, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise, also said all the disciples. And we know what happens. And then further down to verse 75, Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which he said to him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went away and wept bitterly. Because Peter had denied Jesus. You know, we're so wishy-washy sometimes. We make this, these grandeur commitments and you know, we're going to pray for three days straight. We're not going to eat one thing. We're just going to drink water. We're going we're gonna to pray continually all day. Or we're going to give this huge amount. And before we know when the pressure's on and God's knocking and asking where we are, we fold. 
But God knew that was going to happen because he knew we were worth saving. He knew Peter was worth saving. He knew you were worth saving. He knew that sometimes that you would just fold. Sometimes that you would make commitments that are too big to actually fulfill. That's why God's love is so great in these times. Can we give him a praise right now? There's no greater love than that when you lay your down life for a brother. In other words, you can say all day that you love God and you want to live for God like Peter was doing. But what are your actions saying? What is your lifestyle, what lifestyle expressing? How are you showing the love of God that he showed you? <coughs> are you laying down your life? See, Luke 9, 23 says, And he said unto them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. We see again that following Jesus isn't just a mere confession. It's not just a feel-good moment in time, but it's actually an act of obedience. It's an action that requires not just one-time event, but actually a daily action of commitment. Are you taking up your cross daily for God? Are you sacrificing for the kingdom of God like he asked us to do? Uh, what are you doing in your life today is sacrificing and showing the love that God showed us so graciously? You see, the Old Testament and the New Testament are in the same book. Sometimes we think that, you know, it's, it's a separate God. You know, the God, the God of the Old Testament, then we have the God of the New Testament. You know, yeah, back then he was all mean and he was, you know, fire and brimstone and flooding the earth. And, but here's all lo lubby-dubby and everyone's getting along and we're singing a happy song around the campfire. I'm here to tell you that it's the same God, exactly the same God. The Bible says that God says, I change not. There's no variableness in, in shadow of turning. I'm paraphrasing. God doesn't change. He is the same. Absolutely the same. So we're not dealing with a, a different God when we flip over from 2 Kings to Matthew. We're dealing with the exact same time, the exact same God, a different time. But the benefit that we have today, and thank God we're living in the dispensation of grace is that God has allowed mercy and grace to extend. It's kind of like when you're, you're at a bank or you're paying a bill, you, you have like a little grace period. You know, where, you know, you don't really don't have to pay your bills on time nowadays because they already know you're not going to be late. They're like, yeah, we know you're going to be late. Just pay it in three, three days after. That would be great. That's kind of how it is with God right now. But instead of the grace period being three days, God actually gives you your whole lifetime to get right with God. He's provided so much grace that he says, he said to Paul, my grace is sufficient. It doesn't matter what you're going through tonight. It doesn't matter what you face in your life. God's grace is sufficient today. But if we notice back to John 15, verse 14, Jesus says, ye are my friends if you do whatever I command you. We have to notice the word if. The, the word if is dependent on us. He says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. I want to be the friend of God tonight. How about you? So God has placed the burden completely on us. He's saying, look, I've given you so much mercy. I've, I've given you all the grace you could need. There's nothing you could do. He said, where sin abounds, grace does more abound. Hallelujah. He said, it's all laid out for you. It's all ready for you. You know, repentance is here. We're living in dispensation of grace. God says, but if you do what I command you, it's available. So the reason why I live the way I live, my lifestyle, is because of the love of Jesus. Because I don't do this just because to make myself feel better. I do this because God 
had so much mercy on me, spared my life twice. And I don't know how many other times it's happened. But God's rich in mercy and grace. You may wonder, oh God, what, Jordan, what are you doing there? People at work, why do you live, live like that? Why, why don't you go out with us? Uh, come on, why don't you have these jokes with us? Come on, why don't you have a beer with us? I said, no, I can't do that. Because God loved me so much that he died on a cross for me when I didn't deserve it, when I wasn't living right, when I didn't care about anyone but myself. God died for me because he had a plan in the very beginning. You see, Jesus suffered more than any of us could ever imagine. He suffered one of the worst executions there was. The Philist- I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, the Romans were, ex- were experts at execution and torture. The Bible says he's beaten beyond all recognition. He had a crown of thorns pressed upon his head until he bled. He did this all for us so we could have a chance to come to a Sunday night service, come to an old-fashioned altar, and get our lives right with God. Some may be confused still. How, why? How? You don't have any fun. If you only understood what God did for me. If you only could get a grasp on the love of God, the suffering that He endured, that old Him, the old rugged cross, it brings me to tears every time I hear it. Because it wasn't something beautiful. It wasn't something like we, some, some of us are out in the world carry on around their necks a gold chain. It wasn't golden. It wasn't pretty. It wasn't diamond studded. It was, a ter- it was a terrible event for Jesus to go through. It wasn't glorious. It was a bloody, old, rugged cross with nails in it. But he did it for us. Could we stand tonight? The only point I want to get across tonight is for us to understand that God suffered, paid a great price for us. He suffered a great death, and I don't do anything I do for any other reason but because He loves me. It's a love so strong that Paul records in Romans 8, verse 35 through 39, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. In other words, it doesn't matter what circumstances here on earth you find yourself in. The love of God is enduring and will always be there. Nothing can extinguish it or block it. You've not gone too far for Him to reach you. While we are still in the natural, God always has a way to reach us. Now Paul further goes on and explains the supernatural, as, or as we would say, the spirit realm. And continue on verse 37 and say, Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, shall be able to separate me from the love of God. So he has covered us even... Even in the supernatural realm, there's nothing that can touch us. Nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Nothing at all. Nothing. Not an angel. Not Satan. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As the musicians begin to sing, I'd ask you to step forward tonight. I would that we could all pray right now. God, renew that love in my heart. Lord, help me show that love, God, that you express, Lord. Uh, that self-sacrificing love, God. Uh, that thoughtless love, Lord, God, uh, that you showed me. 
so long ago. Help me express that to my brother and sister, Lord. Uh, help me express that, Lord God, to that person out in the street. To that person, Lord, that's hurting. Uh, to that co-worker that's treating me bad. Uh, Lord God, to that waitress, Lord, uh, at the restaurant. Lord, I want them to know the love uh, that you showed me. Let's cry out to God tonight. your voice and sing it on a hill, on a hill far, away, far away stood an old rugged, rugged cross, cross emblem of suffering and shame. and shame God I'm asking you to Lost sinners was slain. Was slain. So I'll cherish, I'll cherish the, the old, old rugged, rugged cross. cross. Oh, till my trophies, trophies at last, last I lay down. Oh, I will cling to the old rugged cross. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, and exchange it someday for a crown. Yes, I'll cherish the old Cross. Till, my Till my trophies at last, at last I lay down. Well, I will cling to the old rugged, the old rugged cross. Change it someday. Oh. Begin to magnify the Lord and talk to Him right where you're at. Jesus, we exalt you. Jesus, I thank you for your touch. God, whatever you have to do to us. Whatever you have to do to stir us. Whatever you have to do to reach us. Oh, 
Hala manda ratia kashalata. Hala la manda rasha darata. Build us a prayer room. Build us a prayer room, Lord. Build us a prayer Come on, lift your voice to the Lord. Respond to what the Spirit is saying to us. God, you have planned it. God, you have spoken it. You are saying it to the church. You have planned the destiny of this I want you to close your eyes before the Lord and I want you to just have a few moments of reverencing his presence. I've never seen a time in all the years that I've pastored this church. I've never seen a time in such a short period of time where we have so many major illnesses going on we have car accidents left and right seems like we've got all kinds of things that are transpiring hear me every eye closed hear me i preached it recently the lord is building some prayer rooms
Have you been fortunate enough, as several have here of late, to go through terrible circumstances that could been could be so much worse, but you need to thank God to that covering that's there and that grace is there. But don't miss the bigger lesson of the dependency upon God that we need. Sometimes God wants to shake our stubborn will. Whatever you got to do, God. But when I count up all the lives that are affected by the people that have been in such drama in the last few months it's actually a good percentage of this congregation has been touched by or directly involved in circumstances that are rattling our cages and, and causing and some of us are not making the connection and not seeing the hand of God that's operating in it but he's building us a prayer room Hallelujah. Just reverence his presence for a moment. God, we will hear your voice. And as bishop of this church, I'm asking you. I'm asking you, God, just keep your hand on us. But whatever you got to send us through, to get our attention whatever you got to do to bring us about to where we need to be just don't let your hand come off of us mm. thinking of a song that I sang not too long ago the words keep coming back to my mind over and over again Lord don't let me take advantage of your grace oh I thank God for his grace and his mercy but Lord don't let me take advantage of it let me respond when you call let me yield myself by choice and not by circumstance All things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to His purpose. Uh -huh. But Lord, let me yield myself to You by choice and not just by circumstance. Take the hand of somebody near you that you can reach on either side if you're able. like doing this every once in a while is just a symbol of unity and a symbol that we're praying together as a body in a corporate body and I'm asking you tonight to pray with me a prayer that requires courage but I'm asking you to pray what I was saying earlier God whatever you got to do to bring us into the posture you're trying to get us into but just keep your hand on us, God. Keep your grace on us. Keep your mercy on us. Uh, but whatever we have to, whatever has to happen, help us to become the revival church that you've called us to be. Would you lift your voice together and pray that prayer? Change our minds, God. Renew our thinking. Rattle our cages if need be. But just don't let us take advantage of your grace. But God, let your mercy be upon this house. And let your grace be upon this house.
And everybody said, in Jesus' name. I am absolutely convinced that God has decided to do something concerning the destiny of this church. And I've also become very persuaded that it's very soon. It's not an event. It's a process. And that process is going gonna, is gonna to be, is going to last, I believe, for a while. And then we'll turn back and look at it and say, we can look at this stage of the history and see what God did in the church. I am convinced of it. And that's why there's so much drama and so much things that are going on all at the same time and seems like so much chaos and stress and, and so many things. But don't lose sight of the fact that God's hand is in the midst of the church. Because if you do, you'll end up on the wrong side of an issue. And you'll end up getting angry at God when what you should be doing is surrendering to God. Because when God decides to bring about His destiny, the corporate body means that it's designated. It's going to take place. It's going. But I've said it a hundred times. What God's going to do with the church is set. I just don't know if I'm going to be a part of it. That is my choice that I make every day when I get up. And I've decided I want to be in the middle of His will. And I hope you do too. Amen, amen, amen. God has spoken very strongly to us today. If you were not here this morning, make sure that you go on our website and catch up with the service. But God is speaking to the church, and I believe it is my full opinion that very shortly we're going to be turning toward an evangelistic time. We're, right now we're in a seed sowing time, and we're in a, we're in a work the field kind of time. But I perceive that our services, they've been very intense. The last few weeks and months have been very strong. It's been corrective and challenging. And, and, but I perceive some of that's going to start to turn here shortly. And that the Holy Ghost is going to take us in another direction. And I want to be ready for that to happen. Can you say amen? Mm. Hallelujah. Brother Eli, could you pull that up just real quick. I was going to do this early in the service and I forgot and then and then it just didn't fit. But it, just before I dismiss, I wanted to show you something. If you'll, um, I have a piece of strange furniture that is in my rental house that is going tomorrow. And I decided that tonight before I take it to the, th or have it taken to the thrift store, I would decide if there's anybody in the house of God that would like it, I'm willing to give it to you, but tithers have priority. Because <laughs> I'm just tired of trying to bless people that, that God can't bless. <laughs> but I know it's an old piece of it. It's a strange kind of entertainment center. It, it, it was given to me, and I'll give it to somebody if you want it or you're interested in it, make your interest known to me tonight because once I leave the building, it is probably too late. Hallelujah. Greet one another. Love one another. You're dismissed tonight in the name of the Lord. God bless you. In Jesus' name.